In Russia, Lenin and Stalin. In the United States, Wilson and Roosevelt. And in England, Chamberlain and Churchill. These countries, these men and their deeds cast historic shadows over our world today. Background Europe, Versailles to Yalta. WOI-TV presents a series of programs on modern Europe. Now, the head of the Department of History and Government at Iowa State College, Dr. Clarence H. Madison. Today we are taking up, in a sense, the end of that era of good feelings that I talked about last time. One, to put it very simply and bluntly, could say that the effect of the depression upon international relations was the ending of the era of good feelings. It wasn't, of course, felt at the time, or at the same degree in various countries all over Europe. The depression hit some countries earlier than it hit others. But it was perfectly obvious that no country that was at all industrialized could have escaped completely unaffected from the effects of the depression that closed in over the world by 1931. It was felt especially, and perhaps first, as far as Europe was concerned, in Germany and Austria, where those two countries that had had their difficulties anyway in the whole of the 1920s because of economic troubles sought to solve those troubles first by forming a terrorist union. That is, in 1930 and 31, they came up with the proposal that one way to solve the problem of getting markets for their goods was to form a terrorist union, abolishing the line of tariffs between Austria and Germany and making goods go across their boundaries without having to pay any duty. And furthermore, that Germany and Austria would have the same tariff against any other uh, countries, and at the end of each year would divide up the profit, so to speak, from tariff rates on a prorated basis among themselves. But this attempted on Schlup, as it was called, was blocked. It was blocked by the financial and the diplomatic pressure of France. The French saw in this merely the beginning of a possible political and truce later on, and their inordinate opposition to any joining of Austria and of France, or uh, Austria and Germany, may have meant that they referred this thing first to the League of Nations and then to a world court. They insisted that this was a violation of all previous treaty arrangements by which Austria promised to keep her sovereign. And the result was that this Anschluss was thrown out, and so the Austrians and the Germans had failed in their attempt to lower a tariff barrier. By the spring of 1931, however, in Austria, something even far graver was occurring. At that time, one of the largest banks of Central Europe, the Credit Anstalt Bank in Vienna, reached the brink of failure, and the failure of the Credit Anstalt Bank not only ruined many people in Vienna itself, but because of the web of, of credit relations and so forth, many banks in Central Europe went down with it. Banks, especially in Southern Germany, that had relationships with the Credit Anstalt. And this failure meant that the whole financial structure of Central Europe was very seriously weakened. And it looked as though there would be a sort of a chain reaction as one bank after another would fail, as was beginning to happen, of course, in the United States. Well, it was at this juncture that Mr. Herbert Hoover, who was then President of the United States, made his proposal of the famous Hoover Moratorium, which was merely a proposal that for one year the various governments of the world would not try to collect any debt to many other governments. Now, this meant immediately the question of war debt and the question of reparations was back on the board. The Hoover Moratorium proposal was accepted but it was accepted only <coughs> belatedly by the French, who saw in this the possibility that the reparations that they were going to get from Germany would not be forthcoming. And they somehow or other were always afraid that private debts would take precedence over war government debt. And in the end, uh, their first mortgage on Germany, as they called their reparations, would finally be passed. It was finally accepted, however, after some delays by everybody, even including the French. And it was hoped during the year from June of 1931 to June of 1932 that somehow or other some new solutions might be found to the serious financial problems that they faced. And yet the, they hoped perhaps that just the worst of the crisis might be over. Perhaps the Depression would solve itself. But still during that year, things went from bad to worse. 
It's during that year that England found it necessary to go off the gold standard. And in the United States, things are certainly still going downhill rather than getting better. So that at the end of the year, conditions were, if anything, worse. And when the powers of Europe met at Lausanne in June of then July of 1932 to consider what to do about it, they did come up with a proposal that they would write off a good chunk of the reparations that Germany was supposed to pay. And instead, Germany would deposit something over $700 million worth of bonds at 5% interest with the Bank of International Settlement in the Switzerland. This bank would hold these bonds for three years and then try to sell them. Germany would make good all of the bonds that were sold, but at the end of 15 years, all those that weren't sold would just be written off. Well, now, the joker to this Lausanne agreement was, however, that the other European countries besides Germany also came to what they called a gentleman's agreement, which was that they would ratify this Lausanne arrangement only upon the satisfactory arrangement of their uh, <coughs> situation with their creditors. Well, now, the creditor, of course, was the United States. And this was just a sort of a nice way of saying if the United States will scale down further our war debts, why then we will be able to scale down Germany's reparations. In the United States, there was no inclination to scale down war debts. The American attitude toward that had been shown time and again in Cal Coolidge's famous statement when asked about the war debt, which was the question, well, they hired the money, didn't they, reflected pretty much the American attitude toward the whole question of writing off the war debt. Hence, the Lausanne Agreement never did mean very much. And later on, Hitler rejected or repudiated any responsibility anyway for any bonds that Germany had issued. All of this, of course, did serve to raise the war debt feeling, so to speak, in the United States. It served to increase tremendously isolationism in the United States. And especially as in the next few years, one country after another uh, refused to pay on their war debt. And that certainly engendered a great deal more international ill will. Another effect of the Depression was that the various countries of the world began turning to economic nationalism as the solution to their domestic economic problems. The United States had already pointed the way in that direction as early as 1922, when we had passed the Fordney McCumber Tariff, thereby making it very difficult for European countries to sell goods to us at the same time trying to collect war debt from them. And in 1931, we raised the tariff barriers even higher with the hawley Smoot tariff. And Great Britain, the free trade country par excellence of the world, found herself abandoning free trade and raising a tariff barrier around Britain in 1931. And other countries were going in for the same kind of thing. So that the result was that there was a tendency not to try to team up together to solve your problems, but to build further walls, so to speak, among the countries, separating them off and, in, and discouraging and choking up world trade rather than encouraging it. The British went on in 1932 to follow Stanley Baldwin's imperial preference system by going to Ottawa and to drawing up in Canada the so-called Ottawa Agreement, by which, of course, the British Empire in general was setting up a vast trade area in which they would give preference to each other and would more or less face the rest of the world unitedly. On top of that, the British did go in for making bilateral trade arrangements of one sort or another. Well, now, of course, once one country does this, the others follow suit. In Paris, bilateral trade arrangements, quota systems, and campaigns to buy only homemade and local made goods appear in all the countries of Europe and indeed of the world. All of these steps were, of course, in the direction of choking up trade rather than of making trade easier uh, to carry on. Also, it's at this time that they go in for various attempts at devaluing their currencies in order to get an advantage over the other country in the, in the world trade field. It's now that they go in for flat restrictions and prohibitions on the goods of other countries and all sorts of political obstacles, such as uh, blocked currency and that kind of thing, uh, comes into the picture. During the period from 1933 to 1939, 
except perhaps for the attempts of Mr. Secretary Hall of the United States in his reciprocal trade program, one could say that there weren't any real efforts being made by important and responsible authorities in the world to lower the barriers to world trade. So that one could say that the overall result of the depression upon international relations was to divide people even further and uh, to make them uh, shut them off one from another rather than to get them to work as a team uh, with each other to solve their mutual problems. And tariff wars and economic nationalism certainly become added now to the list of things that one can list up as causes of World War Number Two. Besides this problem of reviving uh, financial trouble and reviving the reparations debate and so forth, in the 1930s, another problem which had been developing ever since World War I was also coming to a head. And this was a problem which had been disturbing the countries of uh, Europe and including the United States ever since 1919. This was the problem of disarmament. Now disarmament was a question which certainly could be <coughs> looked at as simple or not. Supposedly, the United States took the lead in proposing a disarmament conference to be held in 1921 and in uh, the first month of 1922 at the famous Washington Arms Conference. Now this came uh, in some ways surprisingly since the Treaty of Versailles had promised that there would be disarmament in order <coughs> to uh, get the powers of the world down to the level of Germany. And it was quite true that public opinion in 1919 and 1920 was demanding that something be done to cut down especially the terrific cost of armaments. But it wasn't the League of Nations, it was the United States which had made the, uh, taken the first step. Now the Washington Conference of 1921 and 22 was called primarily to deal with questions in the Far East with China and Japan. But it was also suggested that since there was so much uh, demand for something to be done in cutting down the costs of armament, that they could consider disarmament too. So that was tacked on to the invitations that the United States sent out to countries to come to Washington in 1921 and discuss these things. But immediately, the conference at Washington found that it was going to be limited to talking only about naval matters. The French flatly refused to consider any kind of a conference which might deal with land armament until at least they got some kind of a guarantee of security for themselves uh, to take the place of the Anglo-American alliance they had failed to get. This conference at Washington, coming <coughs> in 1922, did show up right at the beginning of the period some of the problems that were involved in disarmament. That is, it showed that while it was seen to be quite simple to say that of course everybody wants to get rid of, of armaments and so forth, and especially does everybody want to get rid of offensive weapons, the point was that what is an offensive weapon for one country may not be an offensive weapon for another. Geography makes the wants and the needs of one country different from those of another. And right at the beginning of this whole period, the differences, especially between the British and the United States, that uh, were, after all, the two major, uh, potentially major, naval powers, began to show up. The British, looking upon their geographic position as an island kingdom near a large land mass, wanted, for instance, to abolish submarines and aircraft carriers and large capital ships. The British were in a different situation from uh, a country such as the United States. Great Britain had an extensive empire uh, with uh, locations all around the globe. And while the British, of course, did have to have control of the sea lane, so to speak, in order to maintain that empire, it also meant that the statement that the British probably did not have to sail more than 800 miles in sending a ship around the world to go from one fueling station to another. It meant that they didn't have to have the large type of ship with a long cruising radius. And in general, what the British wanted was to have a large number of smaller type ships, the smaller type of cruiser, for instance, or the destroyer. Well, now the United States wasn't in that same kind of a situation. 
The United States needed bigger ships. We didn't have bases strung throughout the Pacific, although we had commitments in the Pacific. And we had to uh, commit ourselves to defending the Philippines, for instance, but we didn't have bases every 800 miles. Therefore, our naval needs were more those of large ships that had a large cruising radius and that could be away from home and from bases longer periods of time. The United States also regarded the submarine and the aircraft carrier as a defensive weapon. Our naval thinking at the time involved the idea that what submarines we had would be used only off our own coast and they would be used purely to repel an invading fort. And airplanes at that stage of the game anyway hadn't acquired much in the way of a cruising radius. And the United States furthermore didn't have many of the cruiser type ships. So we were in favor of abolishing cruisers, but we were in favor of keeping submarines and airplanes. Well, now the British refused flatly to accept the idea that the submarine was a purely defensive weapon. To them, it was an offensive weapon. The submarine had, after all, in World War I, become in the hands of the Germans a very potent force against England. The Germans had, in the spring and the summer of 1917, almost starved England out by the use of their submarines. And so it was a pretty hard job to convince any Englishman that the submarine was a purely defensive weapon. Well, now the Japanese were in a different situation. They happened to have several large submarines on the ways being built, and they didn't want to scrap them. So they favored keeping submarines. They also favored keeping the smaller type ships chiefly because they had devised ways of making their crews live in even smaller and tighter quarters than on other ships, and they could get more fighting equipment, so to speak, on a ship than other countries could. The French came in with a suggestion that why not limit the whole thing by money? Just say each country could spend so much, and then let them spend it the way they wanted. Well, that sounded reasonable until you realized that building costs in France were less than they were in England or the United States, and under such an arrangement, probably the French would come out much better. The Italians came to the Washington Conference with only one thing in mind, and that was the idea of parity in their navy with France. And the French opposed this on the very obvious point that France did have to protect not only the Mediterranean, but also the Atlantic coast, which included the Bay of Biscay and the English Channel. And if they had a total navy equal only to that of Italy, it would mean that in any situation they would not be able probably to have their total navy against Italy and therefore they wouldn't be able <coughs> in a sense to be equal to Italy. That was a comparable situation to the United States and the Japanese demanded parity with us. Well, all of this ended up finally with an agreement only on capital ships or the large type of ships. One of the things of course was that in the war, the uh, years just before World War I, it had become exceedingly expensive to build ships. The new type of ship which had been developed had become a very expensive thing. And furthermore, there was the point, too, that in the World War I, with all of the big capital ships that had been built and all of the money that had been spent on them, still they had been in action against each other only a matter of four hours in four years on the afternoon of the Battle of Jutland in 1916. And even in these battles, which uh, had been fought, it also had been shown that the design of these ships was such that they were not much better than death traps when the sailors were caught in them. Most of the actual naval fighting in World War I had been done by the cruiser class of ships. It had been the British cruisers that had run down the Germans and had run them off of the sea. And <coughs> the result was that those were the ones that seemed most important. Furthermore, there was the great uncertainty as to what the effect was going to be of the submarine and the airplane upon the surface class ship. After all, these were two new inventions which are coming out of World War I, and it wasn't at all clear as to what they had done to the surface ship as a fighting instrument. The airplane had been used, of course, in World War I. It had been used in combat on land, but on sea it had been used largely for observation, and there had been no real test as to what the airplane had done to the surface ship. But the popular demand that something be done did bring it about. 
that the capital ships were limited and aircraft carriers were limited. It was agreed that there would be a 10-year building holiday on building new capital ships. No new ships were to be built except as replacements for ships which were already listed. And uh, replacements could not be made for a ship that was younger than 20 years. Furthermore, in order to make sure that nobody started building uh, battleships and called them cruisers, it was specified that uh, any ship of more than 10,000 tons or carrying larger than 8-inch guns would be called a uh, battleship. And the replacement ratios were fixed so that the United States and Great Britain could replace to a total of 525,000 tons, the Japanese at 315, and the French and the Italians at 175. Now this was the basis of the famous 553 ratio. England and the United States were equal or had parity. Japan could have a 60% navy, and France and Italy had parity at a somewhat less size. The French were willing to grant parity to Italy here as much as anything because they were quite convinced the Italians with their limited resources would never build up to it anyway. Had they foreseen Mr. Mussolini, they might have thought differently. But it was also provided here that no ship could be built over 35,000 tons, which was considered large for that day, and no aircraft carrier of more than 20. But nothing was done here about cruisers or destroyers or submarines. Uh, five years later, at a conference at Geneva, they attempted to come to some agreement on the question of cruisers and of submarines. But this conference got nowhere. As a matter of fact, it ended up in bitter disagreement, so that the United States and Great Britain were further apart than they had been for years, especially when the United States had discovered that it rather liked the 10,000-ton uh, cruiser class and it was well adapted to our needs, and we refused any proposal to limit the size of cruisers. And also it came out that Great Britain and France had come to an understanding before the conference that they would support each other. Fundamentally here, it was still a question the United States wanted a small number of large cruisers, and the British wanted a large number of small cruisers. At a naval conference in London in 1930, when it became time to do something about the 10-year holiday, which had been begun in 1922, the powers met once more, and this time they extended the holiday for five years. They also agreed on total tonnages for cruisers here, and they established a ratio for destroyers, and it was agreed that there would be parity in submarines. But at the London conference, the Italians and the French refused to go along. And the result was that they put into the London Naval Agreement the so-called escalator clause, which was the understanding that if, for instance, the Italians started to build a big navy and threaten the British position in the Mediterranean, then Great Britain could build too. But that meant that Japan and the United States would also build. The whole ratio system would just go on up. And the Italians and the French remained out of any kind of limitation after this. But it's right at about this point that the Germans once more begin to enter the naval building picture. The Germans, restricted by the Treaty of Versailles, were restricted to ships of 10,000 tons. And they developed, through their technicians and their engineering, the so-called pocket battleship. Now, the pocket battleship was a ship that in tonnage remained the same size as a cruiser. But the Germans had managed to put a tremendous amount of firepower and also a tremendous amount of speed onto the pocket battleship. So that while they had stayed within the limitations of the Treaty of Versailles, they had developed a fighting instrument, which was certainly something of a surprise to the rest of the world. In 1934, the Japanese announced that when this five-year period was over on naval building holidays, that they were going to demand parity in 1936. That is, that they would be no longer be satisfied with the 553 ratio, but hereafter it was going to have to be the 555 ratio. Well, the United States and, and the United er, Great Britain wouldn't have anything to do with this. The result was that no Navy conference was held in 1936, and a naval building race was on. And from 1936 on, the Navy building uh, race is wide open. On land, even less was accomplished in the way of disarmament between the wars. 
that French insistence upon security and the refusal of the United States to commit themselves to a treaty supporting France did mean that the French would not uh, go along with any proposal to cut down their standing army of 500,000 men. Now, it was quite true that the League of Nations was committed, of course, here to sponsor disarmament, and that was in the Versailles Treaty. But it took the League of Nations a half a dozen years to get around to doing anything about it, as much as anything because France continually blocked proposals. But finally, in 1926, the League did form what was called the Preparatory Commission to consider what they might do if they had a disarmament conference. And, of course, since it would be foolish to have a conference of this kind without the United States and Russia, the United States and Russia were invited to come along. Well, almost immediately here, they came uh, into these difficult questions. One of them was, what are effective in fighting? Now, the French and others that had the conscription insisted that people in the reserves were not to be considered effective fighting men. Whereas Great Britain and the United States and Germany said that a man who's just had four or five years of military training is certainly a very important fighting man. And so they couldn't come to an agreement over that kind of a thing. Who is an effective and who is not? In 1928, Mr. Litvinov of Russia came in with a proposal that all countries simply disarm completely over a four-year period, that they uh, take 50% uh, of their armaments and destroy them in the first year and the other 50 in the next three years. This was rejected by the British as a communist plot to disarm the capitalist world while the communists plotted a world revolution. In the meanwhile, the Germans were demanding more than ever, and Hitler was making much of it, that the Allies should uh, do something about disarmament. And Hitler was pointing out that the Allies themselves were not living up to the Treaty of Versailles that they were forcing upon Germany. Well, finally, after much negotiation and bickering, the actual disarmament conference got together in January of 1931. But it bogged down on the French demand for security, and when Mr. Hoover proposed a one-third reduction of armaments around the world across the board, that, that proposal was rejected too. And by 1932 and 33, after many uh, adjournments and recesses, it became apparent that the disarmament conference wasn't going to get anywhere. And when Hitler came to power in 1933 in Germany, obviously France wasn't going to disarm. By that time, too, Japan had moved into Manchuria, and the, the situation in the Far East had become critical. It was on this question that Hitler withdrew Germany from the League. And the failure, so to speak, of disarmament was another one of the major failures that the League of Nations encompassed. And this meant that the League no longer was looked at as an important weapon in international affairs. Monday afternoon, our lecture deals with the Alliance system and the Rome-Berlin Axis on Background Europe with Dr. Clarence H. Matterson, head of the Department of History and Government at Iowa State College, co-author of a book on Europe, Development of European Civilization. This program is presented each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday afternoon at 2.30 by WOI-TV and the Fund for Adult Education as established by the Ford Foundation. Production by Neil Mailer, John Clark, Fred Mullen, and Harry Heath. Technical Director Charles Hawley. This is Roger Leith bidding you a pleasant good afternoon until Monday.